maybe a little bit flustered. I had a few little uh, uh, computer issues, <laughs> uh, but I hope I'm, I'm straight. Uh, we're, um, we, we gave a seminar a couple of weeks ago on ServNet, but we stuck to traditional um, total station data and the general running of the program. Today we're going to look at the um, – try to concentrate on – GPS vectors and combining GPS vectors with um, traditional total station. We, we have here with us Dean Goodman. Some of you, or hopefully many of you, will know Dean. Dean is the G in C and G and, um, and is here to answer your questions. And he will, uh, I believe he can uh, chime in and help me when, when I stumble. Uh, my name is Donnie Stallings. I'm a land surveyor. Uh, I'm the developer of ServNet. Um, basically, this ServNet started in the, I think, in the late late 90s. I sort of wrote it for my own use and just to see if I could do it. And eventually, it's, Dean's an old friend, and we incorporated it into CNG, and now it's being incorporated into uh, the Carlson. Um, but let's go ahead and start the uh, the the projects. And I've, I've chosen very simple projects today. Uh, that do combine GPS and, and total station. I'm going to start off and I'm going to sort of explain and show you the data we're working with, then I'll show the project settings, and then um, we'll process the job, show the reports, and hopefully we'll get to show some blunder detection and maybe the, the, some of the ALTA. Um, So I'm going to. I'm just going to go ahead and start with with the the data that we were going. If y'all can see my screen, you can see all we really for this particular job. We just have a simple triangle of uh, GPS vectors and then some the the, the, the total station data. And there you can see the, the vectors, and then I'll cut the, uh, the total station data. See, this is, this is a, a very simple job, but I think it, it, it illustrates what we're trying to show today. The first thing we'll, let's look at is what is the GPS vectors. Um, I'm, sometimes there appears to be some confusion among people as to what data is in a GPS vector. So let's look at the actual vector data. And vector data in GPS is actually simple data. Uh, it goes back to surveying 101. It's nothing but lat lats and depths uh, with the three in, uh, with the inclusion of difference in elevation. And it's in the Earth-centered uh, coordinate system. But if you look at this, is very typical GPS data, and you'll see it going from, from BDF-04 to BDF-05, we have our delta X, delta Y, delta Z, and then we have these G2 and G3 records, which are basically, in a nutshell, they're the, the standard errors of the um, of the GPS data. It's telling us how accurate the GPS data, which all this comes, typically comes from post-processing software of GPS office desktop. And um, to be a little more specific, these, these four numbers are variances and covariances. Um, but generally speaking, they're just sort of how it tells the computer or tells the program how accurate our GPS data should be. Um, there's all kinds of different formats for this for these GPS vector files. The file we're looking at here is an ASCII uh, text file. It's in the StarNet format, and to me, the StarNet format is the easiest format to work with. Um, and most GPS processing programs will output a StarNet format. But this is just sort of the overview of what GPS data looks like.
looks like, and specifically the GPS data for this for this project. Donnie? Yes? Uh, we have a question about uh, okay. RTK data and how and if that can be processed. Um, RT, I think different manufacturers may handle this differently. RT, R, I know that a lot of RTK data can be post-processed with the office software and very often um, you can output these type vectors. As a general rule, I think with most man GPS manufacturers, you almost have to use their post-processing software to, um, to create these vectors. One thing we haven't mentioned is certainly a very good valid method. Instead of entering GPS vectors, you certainly can enter GPS coordinates into your project. And if you put in honest standard errors of those coordinates, you can run an adjustment and the GPS coordinates will adjust based on you know, the, what total station data you have in there with it. So bringing in GPS vectors is probably, might be, maybe be the best way to do it, but it's not the only way. Just bringing in GPS coordinates is certainly fine. You probably won't, but you need to have decent standard errors, which most of your GPS software will generate to tell you what the, the standard errors of those coordinates are. Um, so that's, so RTK can be, you know, generally when we're, we're dealing with vectors, you're talking about post-processing and further manipulating the data back in the office. Usually you, to create the vectors, you probably have to use the post-processing software and then further in, in our, uh, this network least squares, then you're, you're even further processing it. And uh, I hope that's the best answer uh, or the best explanation uh, for, for the RTK data. Um, now to get away a little bit from our GPS data, we are certainly incorporating total station data into this network. And so let's just take a brief look at the um, total station raw data. The first thing I'm going to look, now in this particular project, they, we've included two raw data files. One of the raw data files only has the coordinates of the control points, which I think is a good way to set up your project. So we'll take a look at that. And if you, you, you'll see this is an editor, and it has, for this GPS project, we have one single coordinate. With GPS data, since vectors give you sort of a direction we can get away with just a single coordinate. With just total station data, you, you generally need two coordinates or one coordinate in an azimuth. But here we have a single coordinate, and this would be in, I think we're in a Texas state plane, and we've got the project set up to be feet, and the elevation expects to be orthometric in this case. Notice that in this record, we have what is called the standard error record, which is telling us how should we treat this control point in terms of its accuracy. We've got these little exclamation points here which tells the program that we want to hold this point fixed. So that's a special character telling us that we have a one fixed control point. Now let's actually look at the total station data. And we, we go into this editor. And this, for those of you f familiar with uh, total station raw data, which I'm sure most of you are, you can see we just have an instrument point, the HIs, the back sites, the horizontal angle, slope distance vertical angle to all our four sites. Uh, a couple of things to notice in this data is on this setup, notice that he has turned a set. There's his initial back site. 
and then you can see here's his 180, or basically 180, to his backside. So he's basically got a set here. Our software, when it processes this, will average this set. We'll recognize it as a set, and we'll average the angle, and a single angle will be pushed into the actual least squares processing. And we'll, we may talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, but I think that's all I'll touch on on the raw data. Y'all probably all seen very similar um, total station data. And let's sort of step away from the data. So that's the data we are working with on this project. Very simple, basic triangle vector with GPS with some added um, total station data. You can see we have some redundancy here. We have sort of a loop here and connecting to some of the GPS here. And when you're processing GPS data, the two most important things are understanding your data and then understanding the different settings of the, the project settings. So we need to t touch on the project settings. Um, when you're dealing with GPS data, in our program, you, you have to be in a good geodetic coordinate system. You cannot choose while we have a local system that you can use when you're working in this 2D, 1D model, if you're using GPS, you have to be in a full geodetic system. So we're in the 1983 state plane system, North Carolina, sorry, Texas North Central Zone, and we are working in the 3D model. Just a brief overview, the 3D model, the all the adjustment is done to both all three axes is simultaneously. The X, Y, and Z are all adjusted simultaneously. The 2D model, we adjust first the horizontal and then a separate process adjusts the vertical. Or you can only choose to just process 2D. The other thing to realize, if you're in the 3D model, you have to have complete 3D information, which means you have to measure all your rod heights, measure all your HIs. In the 2D model, if you want to do just a horizontal adjustment, you can. You don't need the uh, rod heights and um, HIs. So the, the whole key to the GPS processing is pick your state plane or a geodetic system and pick the 3D model. Notice we have here the for um, the horizontal units here we've got set to US feet. Um, so the output will be in US feet. In this particular project, I have the geoid separation I have set to zero, and I'm not going to use a geoid file. Um, at least this small job, I, I've ran it both ways. It, it was just a very slight improvement. I had to switch computers. That's what I was flustered about. And I'm not even positive I have the geoid set up for this computer. But anyway, we, if we have time, we'll come back to this. But for this small of a project, it really just doesn't matter. We, would just, we could either we could have gone to the NGS site and maybe got a good separation, or I'm just going to use zero and I won't have any real problems because it's such a small site. Um, we'll go next. I'm going to move over to our input files, and and this top section shows our the, the two files that had our our um, raw data from the total station. Notice I have this set to US feet, so we collected the total station data in feet. And this bottom, or the little box right below this, has the, our GPS vector file. And it's in, like I said, we're using the ASCII StarNet format. And notice that this, very often your GPS vectors are in meters. So I have this set to meters. This can become a little bit confusing. You have data from three or four different places, and sometimes some of the stuff's in meters, some in feet. So you've got to be careful about these settings. But in our particular job, we're going to be output in feet, total station is in feet, and our GPS is in meters. The, uh, and I'm going to move to the next tab, which is the pre-processing. Uh, we have the curvature refraction correction. 
in this small job, it probably would not matter. I, I think I did run a, a little test, and it improved it slightly to do the curvature refraction correction. Um, this particular job, I've got it set up to get a Jeep to – we'll do a loop closure on that GPS triangle. So I've got – that's what this toggle is for. And depending on our time, I may go into more details how I set that up. But the way it is set up, we will get a GPS closure on our um, triangle there. I, I recently had someone sort of lecture me that GPS closures, just like traverse closures, are getting sort of obsolete. Um, but we can, we can compute them. Uh, down below we have this tolerance, which we have an angle, horizontal angle tolerance, vertical angle tolerance, slope distance tolerance, and this as a part of the, this is all part of pre-processing or before it gets to least squares, it sort of validates the data, and if it finds a set, it'll check the spreads, you know, between your sets, and if there's any um, difference, it will display the display your spread errors. So within this program. Before you even get to least squares, your data will be is validated, and, and you have some checks on your sets and so forth. And we'll move away from the pre-processing, and let's and let's go to the standard errors. The standard errors are just basically saying what is how accurate was the data that you collected. Um, for the total station data, we have distances and we have angles. So for our distances, I've got this set up to a hundredth with a PPM of five, a hundredth, that may be a little bit high. Uh, you get this information from probably the easiest way is your total station documentation. I'm not sure that's the best way to get it. Uh, going out to an EDM calibration and running through a, a real calibration test can maybe give you a better idea of this. And we all know that our total stations do not turn perfect angles, so you have to give us an idea of how accurate these angles are. And this is all for a single pointing. Um, and we all know we can't set up the instruments perfectly over our target, so you've got to tell, tell us a little bit how, how well you can center your instrument and your prism. And when we're finally computing the final standard errors of the angles, we incorporate all this information in this instrument center, and it'll take into account the distances to the back sites, distance to the four sites, and we'll come up for how accurate you should have been able to turn that specific angle based on these settings and based on how you know distances to back site, distances to four sites. In in that raw data, if you remember back, I showed where the where we set the control to, to fix. So that the any settings in the raw data file set the coordinate standard errors, but you can override I'm sorry, they override the settings in this screen. This screen sets the default coordinate standard errors if there were no records in the raw data indicating the standard errors of your coordinates. Now the standard errors of the GPS vectors are generally in the file. That, that's where those variance covariances I were pointing at. But they do not take into account how, how accurate you set up your instrument over the GPS point. So we allow you to set that in this, this field. And also it's the GPS vectors tend, the manufacturers or the statistical methods tend to, over, a lot of people think they overestimate how accurate those vectors really are. So these, this vector standard error factor is just a way to sort of bump up the standard errors of the vectors automatically without having to actually edit the vector files. And that's what that is. That's a brief overview of the standard errors. Let's go to the adjustments. For those of you who are used to least squares, you'll see we have maximum iterations. How many times is it going to try to process this job before it finds a good solution? We're setting it to 10. We'll consider a good solution, any solution that, that after it processes, 
it quits changing the solution by amount of a we got a millimeter here or uh, or to the third place there. Uh, we're going all the statistics. We've got it set up to show to the 95 percentile confidence interval. Uh, this is some of that rel relative error ellipse information, which basically relates for that for the average surveyor. This relates to ALTA standards and testing and. I have this set up so we will do some ALTA testing and we'll be able to look at the job. If, if y'all notice that I have these tolerances are presently set well below the ALTA standards and I'll show you why on that a little bit later. Um, but so I'm actually checking if we pass, we know we're a whole lot better than the ALTA standards. The output options tab is just the um, how many decimal places are we going to show the, the, the you know the, the coordinates, the distances, and you know, and then finally, once your your job is processed, you can write we can write it out to a coordinate file. This allows us to tell us what kind of coordinate file we want to write it out to. Uh, I'm not going to allow, uh, pro, I'm not going to send it to a um, coordinate file as of yet. So these are the main settings. So if you understand your data. You understand the um, the project settings, then you have the, pr the program figured out. That's the, the two most important things. So we'll click on that, and our next step is why don't we just go ahead and let's process this 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 project. Uh, of course, the project we can process it just from a menu option, network adjustment. We also have this icon, same thing. And it processed the project. Whenever you process a project, you end up with several of these windows containing different reports. This particular report is sort of an error report, and it gives us, it shows all the warnings. It gave us the traverse closure. Uh, so that's one report. Another report is nothing but the adjusted coordinates, so we have that. The most important report is, is this report, which is, is the, you know, the full statistical um, portion of the, the final results. Let me briefly go over the different sections. Notice that you can sort of page through the different sections of the report using these tabs. I'll be going through the whole report, so I'll just start here the entire report. This first section just mostly shows the project settings, so you have a record of those. And then it starts showing some of this pre-processing information, like these angle spreads. And that's what this is telling you right here, that they did an angle spread and they have 10 seconds worth of, worth of error. That's certainly not, not much to be worried about. Um, we come through here. It, it does some checks on some horizontal distances. We're having a tenth, seven hundred. So there's a little bit of slop in here. Um, probably nothing to be too alarmed about at this point. Uh, to talk a little bit about the 3D model, all this data is converted, what we call a mark-to-mark -mark vertical angle and a mark-to-mark -mark slope distance which is the actual vertical angle, not that you measure from the total station, but from the actual point, the monument point to monument point. And we're seeing 1920s up to almost up to a minute. Well, there's a two-minute spread, which might make you worry a little bit, but we're going to move on. For unadjusted... Observations, it lists our control points. Notice that it's saying that this one point is fixed. We display the, the coordinate as latitude, longitude, grid, and geocentric. And then it shows the mark-to-mark -mark slope distances. And this is the standard errors. Notice that they are different for each one. And the second thing to notice is that the, high, the longer the distance, the more error there usually will be you know, because of our PPM value back in the settings. And so here's our mark-to-mark -mark vertical angles. All this is the raw, sort of the raw 
processed prior to least squares data. Here's our horizontal angles. Um, and here's the standard errors. Notice, boy, these are, I hadn't looked, noticed these, but these are some really high standard errors here. Now, this is pre-processing. My bet is that this is a side shot that's only five feet away or something from the instrument point, which is why you end up with such a very high standard error here, which, of course, 500 seconds over five feet is, is, is probably nothing to be worried about. Now here's your here's your GPS vectors that that'll be incorporated. Notice we have our delta x, delta y, delta z's, our variances, which are sort of equivalent to the standard errors, and covariances, which are sort of tell us how accurate PDF04 is in relationship to PDF05. What is the error relationship between those two specific points? Notice we did, we were getting our GPS closure, and so this shows this, that triangle perimeter at a, about 576 feet, we had a precision of 1 in 40, about 45,000, which that's such a small job and such a small triangle, that's probably, I mean, you lot, most time with GPS, this number's a lot bigger, but I think most of the time, that's probably related to it's just not a very big, big triangle. Then we have our adjusted coordinates, our adjusted um, grid coordinates, our adjusted geocentric coordinates. And then we have our error ellipses, and these all error ellipses look pretty good. We do have some, some in the tents here. And then here's that also relative air ellipse, and, and the reason I'd set that so low is I wanted it to spit out. I wanted to have some points failing, and I'm going to come back and, and maybe talk about this a little bit later, but, but as you can see, we are getting a full alta tolerance report, and I'll go into more details on this section of the report and how we got this if we have time. Now we're getting into what I consider the most First thing I look at when I look at my least squares data after I've done the report, I look at these residuals, which is basically saying how much did least squares change these distances. And you can see looking through here that about a tenth is about the biggest amount it changed any of those distances, which that makes me feel pretty good. If everything, if nothing got changed from its original position by, I'm sorry, I said a tenth, I'm in a hundredth. Uh, and our adjusted angles, all the adjustments, you have a 15 and 18 second adjustment. Um, considering this is probably not a, this is probably an average job, not a geodetic, small, civil job for some, I'm not sure what the purpose of this survey was for, but you can see Nothing, nothing about this alarms me. The adjusted vertical angles, there again, they all look pretty good. Uh, they, a lot of times you tend to see more adjustment in these vertical angle residuals, but I'm seeing big as six seconds. So that all looks pretty good. We can look down here at our GPS vectors, and um, we're seeing you know, the hundreds, which all, all in all, everything, there's no big problems here. Everything looks pretty good. And then we get down to our final thing, which is the statistics. We have a uh, 21 degrees of freedom, which tells you how much re redundancy we had, and it um, passed the chi-square test. For those of you who are not familiar with the chi-square test, let me briefly tell you what th this is. And and you never live and die by the chi-square test. That's, a lot of people will tend to just look at that and, and say you failed it, and therefore my survey's bad. But this is just one indication of the whole survey. We passed it here. A, a couple of, and all this, this number here, 21.573, is all it's doing is comparing the final adjustment 
to the standard errors that we set in the project settings, which with those standard errors in our project settings were our, they were the indications, they were, they were our guess of how accurate this data was. Least squares process the data, and by passing the chi-square test, it's sort of telling us this, this data matches what you set in your project settings. If you pass, if this number is lower than this 10.83, it'll say you failed the chi-square test. But you would have failed it on the low end, which tells you that your data was too good. It was a whole lot better than your standard errors, which statistically you failed, but in actuality you did a whole lot better than what you thought you were going to do. That, that touches the brief, you know, that this report is really almost the most important thing, and, and, um, and I guess I'll just stop here, and, and Dean, is, do we have any questions concerning <clears throat> this, this report? Uh, yeah, well, there's a question here uh, that, that came in just a minute ago that said, what is an acceptable mean square root? I'm not exactly sure what, what they mean by that. Uh, the root mean square? Root mean square, yeah. Okay, the root mean square, I like to look upon the root mean square is, is if there's any statisticians out there, they, they, they might cringe when I say this, but it's really, it's sort of an average residual. It's, you, you see we have this list of residuals. If you, it's almost as if, if you were to take the, take the, you know, get rid of these negatives, and average these numbers, you're going to be real close to the root mean square. So it's ba it's almost an average of your residual. And and you'll see if you look at this data, I mean, what do we have? We have some zeros: 0 0.005, 0 0.008, 1.1. You'll see 0 0.004. Well, if I were just to glance at this data and assume that I took the absolute value, 0.004 is going to be real close to. Um, to what, what, what you would get. So it's, it's sort of an average residual. Uh, if, I think it's, 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 it's a fine number to look at. If you had a big bad residual in here, you know, seeing some bad residuals, that, that pops out just as, as bad as a, the root mean square. So, but it's just an average residual. And of course, just to repeat, because I think this is very important, the residual is nothing more than how much adjustment least squares applied to that specific measurement. And this standard residual maybe might need to be mentioned is, in theory, what we want to see is all ones here. And if there are, this is sort of a ratio to what was the actual residual compared to the standard error on, on the distance. So it's sort of the standard error is, is your prediction of how accurate this distance is. This a residual is sort of saying how much least squares adjusted it, so that divided by that other number you know, you're looking for one. Now, well, one thing that we do, and you don't see it in this report because this data is all pretty good, is if if this number goes above two, we'll put an asterisk beside it to sort of flag it to let you know this might be something you need to look at, which is going to come into play in just a minute. I, I see we're going to have time to go into this. I think this is one of the, the best part of our, what I like about our program is some of our blunder detection routines. And just to talk a little bit about blunder detection, uh, the, the we've been supporting this program, and me and Dean have been helping people run it, and we've been running it ourselves. And 90% of all problems are related with total with data collectors. We don't miss right angles and distances anymore. What we do is we put wrong point numbers down, and 
some of this blunder detection stuff that I'm getting ready to show is very good at uncovering those errors. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to monkey with this data and put some uh, create some problems. <laughs> and I'm going to go to uh, I think I will go and edit this GPS file. And the first thing I'm going to do is one thing with least squares is is if you shoot point three, then no matter where you shoot point three, you should always use the same point number three. Some people tend to not use point the same point number. And what we're going to do, let's just say that they were collecting this GPS data, and I'm going to say instead of they let's say that they made a mistake. And they shot to this BDF004, but let's say they made a mistake, and when they were putting it in the data collector, they called it 14, which there is no BDF014 really. This should be 4, but let's just say that the guy in the field made that mistake. So now Lee Squares is going to think that that point is a separate point from BDF04. So I'm going to save this file. And now if we process this file, it still processes fine, and, you know, we don't get any, there's nothing jumping out of us saying that there's, you know, you might notice that this report says BDF 14 when you knew there was no BDF 14 but there's nothing that just really flags that point as being a bad point. And, of course, if you had 100 GPS vectors, then it might be hard to see that. So I'm going to go to pre-process, I'm going to go to blunder detection, and we have several blunder detection methods, and the most useful one is this pre-process the raw data. And I'm going to um, run this, and, and I'm going to go, for this particular report, I'm going to go straight to the end of the report. And look what it tells me. It says BDF004 and BDF014 are within point zero zero four of each other. So we, you know, I mean, that's an immediate flag that tells me something, you know, that, 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 that that's a misnumbering problem. It, you know, who, who locates two points that are within less than a hundredth of each other? Um, so... We just immediately see we've got a problem, and then I immediately look here and I ask the party chief, what's this BDF-014? And he says, oh, looks like a problem. He said, I must have misnumbered it. So we got that. Just to show you this report, um, notice that we have this thing called the K-matrix analysis. I'm going to show you a better example of this in a minute. But this also is a very important tool, and we're going to come back to it in a second. So anyway, we let's go back and let's fix our BDF-14. Now, what's the other classic point number and problem? Let's say he shot BDF004, but him and the Rodman were talking about what they were going to do Friday, Friday night, and they misnumbered it and called it BDF005, which that's going to create a real problem if the computer thinks this vector goes to BDF-5 when it really goes to BDF-004. So anyway, let's take a look what this is going to do to our data. So the first thing I'm, I'm going to do, let's just say I'm going to run regular least squares on it. And it, it, it um, converts, so my, my initial reaction, oh, well, everything's fine. And then I start going down through the report. And the first thing I see is adjusted coordinates error ellipses. 
hundred hundred feet. That does not look good. Now look at our residuals. You know, we got all kinds of asterisks by the data. Um, here we're, it, it, it added 3,000. It adjusted one of our angles by 3,000 uh, seconds. We got we got problems here. Now least squares sometimes can. Well, now this. Look at our look at our vertical angles, and you can see it's sort of pointing out this problem BDF four to BDF oh five one fifty five. So we certainly just by looking at the regular report, something looks suspicious here. But the report all throughout this report, it sort of is pointing to problems. So there may be a better way that goes to our specific problem. So I'm going to go back. So I know I've got a problem with my data. I'm going to go back to our blunder detection. I'm going to pre-process the raw data again. I'll try that trick. And this time, there's this. Let's go down to this what we call this K matrix analysis. And it sort of it shows us a measured angle at an initial computed angle, you know, 10 seconds. That does, there's no real problem there. Four minutes, well, that's not initially. I'm not going to worry too much about that. Four minutes on vertical angles, nothing real problematic on this vertical angle report. And so everything looks good on my vertical angles. Then it starts showing the the GPS vectors, look, 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 look at that. L16V to this BDF005. And it just immediately points out, you see you have immediate problems. You got 30, 30, 55, and 94 feet. And notice everything else up here looks pretty good. So this the least squares, the main least squares report pointed, maybe would give you some clues, but this right here is a huge clue. Can I have one thing, Donnie? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is, is when people make the mistake of calling, using the same point number for two different points by accident, that most of the time uh, when I've gotten files like that from clients, it, it would not converge. So. If you process the data and it does not converge, if it says uh, this this project does not con converge within 10 iterations, then the very first thing I always look for is is people uh, uh, having point numbering problems. Yes. Yes. The other thing to realize is if your project is not converging, like we under this blunder detection, we have three different blunder detection methods. And all these methods, you know, that there is, we all know that none of the, n nothing is perfect, and, and all they, all these methods can do is give you hints. And if the project is not converging, these second two blunder detection methods basically won't won't work. That they they won't tell you anything of of, of value, and and there's no guarantee that that they're going to point right to the blunder in the first place. But to me, generally speaking, this pre-process, the raw data, gives you the best initial information. Let's try this, this other, I call it this float one observation method, and let's just see if it's going to give us a clue as to what our problem is. This has to do a least square adjustment for each point in the data. So it, it takes it takes a second. And so it created this error report and let's look and let's see. And see this is one of the cases where this method just really didn't give me much. To be honest with you. Look, we, we if if everything had worked perfectly, there would 
just be one asterisk by one measurement. Now, do notice this, is that on where we do have the error, it did put two asterisks over here. So the, so the biggest problem, it is, in a way, it is sort of pointing out to us that this might be where the problem is, and that certainly is where our problem is. So that method, you know, take a look up at this adjusted vertical angle. The biggest biggest residual was right in there with that 04 to 05, which is where our problem is. So there again, if you know how to look at these reports, it's sort of pointing us out to the, prob to the problem. Well, we've looked at two of those methods, we might as well look at the final one, see if that gives us any help. And so I call this the reweight based on residuals, which the way it works is it tries to stick all the error into one measurement, and hopefully the measurement it tries to stick all the error into is the blunder, and let's see if it did that. I believe it's going to basically put most of the error in this measurement, which is a L16B to BD05. So it's it's sort of pointing to BDF05 as our, as our problem. I mean, you, you know something that's around BDF05 is um, pointing to the problem. But mathematically, the, the most simple and basic method is this pre-process, and I find it actually the most useful. And it pointed right to our problem. See it there? There, there it is. So anyway, we can go back and let's fix fix our data. I've almost forgot which one. I think it was this one, wasn't it? Change that back to four. Yeah. Um, do we do we have any do we have any questions at this point? It looks like I've got about seven minutes left. I, I have one other thing I can show, but I'll be glad to hit a, hit any questions at this point. Well, there's a question uh, here about uh, RTK coordinates uh, brought in with along with total station uh, data. Uh, I just responded. Uh, you may want to discuss a little bit about coordinates and raw data files and how we treat those. Okay. In, in least squares, coordinates can be measurements every much as they're treated, mathematically they're treated as measurements, and they may have error. So if you go out and you RTK a bunch of stuff, you may have a bunch of coordinates from some points, and your RTK said that those points are accurate to 500. So what you can do and, and then maybe your control, let's say, was to, you still wanted to con have your control fixed, but you had a bunch of RTK that was only accurate, let's say, to a, a tenth. So, now I'm getting ready to start entering a bunch of junk, just to illustrate, but let's say, so we had an RTK point of 10,000, 10,000. And what we can do is we can insert a standard standard error record and say that this RTK point is only good a uh, tenth. So now when this runs through least squares, it, because this precedes point L16B, it knows to hold it's a fixed coordinate, but it knows this point is only accurate to a tenth. So you're, when you do your least squares adjustment, this point will end up 
floating a bit. It'll, it will adjust to the total station data because it's only accurate to a tenth. So that's certainly a good viable way to enter your RTK data into a least squares adjustment. <clears throat> There's another question about a, uh, uh, what type of GPS files do we support and are there any conversion utilities? Yes, let me, um, I want to delete this out because this is, if I tried to do anything with this 10,000, 10,000, things would go from bad to worse. We do support, a variety, under tools, we have this convert GPS file to ASCII. And basically these are the files that, that we currently support. We support the ASHTEC O file, which is a binary file. We support a, a Leica format. I, I, th I guess there's a standard Leica one. I've sort of forgotten the details. There's a Topcon, had several formats, a TVF. They had a Topcon XML, which was not exactly a land XML, but it was Topcon's own XML. There was a Trimble Data Exchange format, which I believe the Trimble Data Exchange format was a standard ASCII file for all kinds of data from Trimble, total station and GPS, vectors included. We include the Trimble data, the DC files, and land XML. So we, we can, you know, if you can get your data into one of these formats, we can um, probably deal with them. Question about Rhinex. Okay, Rhinex is unprocessed data, and we really have no means of getting Rhinex directly into um, into a GPS vector. So you'll have to take your GPS data and use your post-processing software and convert that Rhinex to a GPS vector that we can read. We have a, another minute left. I'm going to just open up another simple project. I, I sort of wanted to show this project for sort of one simple reason. And this project is from a small surveyor, worked I think maybe just by himself and maybe one helper. And he's sort of taken advantage, and you know, and he does sort of boundary work. It's not high accurate geodetic work. Uh, so basically what he does is he has one, he has, a, he has two GPS units. I think they very well might be single frequency. He puts one in his yard where it's protected, where he doesn't have to worry about it. And then he takes the one, other one out to his job. And by itself, these vectors are nothing but side shots and probably not particularly good by themselves. There's no real check. But then he uses it and he ties in and loops his traverse and all of a sudden he has vector, he has redundancy, he has checks on his total station work and he has checks on his GPS data. Now this, certainly the geodesists out there and the people who do highly accurate GPS work, you know, might say so certainly not the best way to do GPS work but under these circumstances and the kind of work he does, it just shows how simple and straightforward it, all this, you can use it, the average surveyor, without burdening a whole bunch of time. I mean, for him to have collected these vectors probably did not add a huge amount to this job. And he has decent redundancy for a boundary survey. And, and I guess the only thing I was, I sort of, was wanting to show you that, you know, least squares is can be for everybody. It's, it's, one of the things I skipped, and I think it was because I was flustered, I had an opening um, PowerPoint, but I wanted to show why to use least squares. And one of the main reasons I, people say they don't want to use least squares, they say, well, I don't do accurate enough work. I don't... Um, my coordinates don't seem to change much from my commas to my least, from a least squares adjustment. And the quality of your coordinates are about the most unimportant reason why to go to least squares. There's, least squares is so much flexible. If you understand these programs, 
You process data just as quick. You get so much more information. Um, if you want me to preach to you about how great Lee Squares is, give me a call one, one time. I've, I've been trying to figure it out for 20 years and finally figured it out. Now I'd like everybody to use it. Um, I see we're at 1 o'clock. I know, Dean, what in the procedure, we'll stay here and answer questions. I guess questions go through you, and I'll, I'll answer them, or you'll answer them or for the next Yeah, uh, uh, we, we can remain on and, and answer any uh, questions uh, anybody might have. Uh, just send them in, and, uh, and I'll either answer them or pass them on to Donnie. Thanks, everybody, for um, for for coming. Uh, and I hope I hope it was useful. My email, if you have any questions or would like to contact me in regards to this program, my email is d o n n e l s at bellsouth dot net. I guess I can be pretty for those. See that thing? See what? I'm I sorry, stuck I was... up the, my email address. Oh uh, yes, I do see it. And uh, if anybody wants to reach me, mine is dgoodman at carlsonsw.com. Oh, here's a good question. Uh, when this webinar is put put up on the uh, on the uh, uh, Carlson website and they download it, will they be able to see the questions that were asked and answered, or is that kind of hidden? You know, Dean, I I, I don't know. I haven't I haven't actually downloaded one of those and, and, and viewed one of them. Well, I haven't either, so I don't have an answer for this uh, for this guy. Uh, so I'm not real sure. <clears throat> well, I don't see. Oh, there's a question. The guess was probably not. Somebody else responded. Probably, probably yeah. so. Well, uh, if anybody's still on, there's still a few people online. Uh, I was just going to uh, reiterate what Donnie said: is one of the, the real powers of Network Week Squares is not necessarily processing the data and getting better results. It's the flexibility it allows you to be. Uh, in the field to be able to be creative in the way you mix your GPS, your traverse. Uh, you can do uh, triangulation, you know, angle-only records. Uh, you can do trilateration. You can do resection. Uh, all these, all these processes are can be handled within the least squares processing. And uh, the order of your data does not matter. Uh, uh, so you can do your traverses in any order you wish. Yes. If these are these are all extremely powerful uh, tools for the surveyor. Yes, uh, it's, me and Dean actually talked about what were the advantages of least squares, and we each came up with a list. Here is here is my list. It, it says you are not tied to a simple traverse. Any combination of angles, distance can be incorporated. I, because I end up doing this programming, I tend to just do small surveying jobs, and and I find even on small lot surveys. In small boundaries, about 60% of the jobs that I do any adjustment, there will be redundancy based on something that least squares allow me to do besides a simple traverse. But we can weight our measurements. Uh, if you ran some of your thir data went through a, a, um, a swamp and you wanted to get most of the air, and that's where you think most of the air is, that you can weight the measurements in the swamp get it in there. We got so much more statistical data once you understand this data. and We got a lot better at blundering 
detection methods. Um, if you want to understand GPS survey, and I think understanding least squares and statistics is entirely necessary, you, we, the fact that we can combine this data, GPS and, and angle and distance, is, is uh, important. Uh, and the new accuracy standards, the ALTA standards, you're going to find yourself having to do some of this stuff. And my last mention was the least squares provides the, the best statistical valid final coordinates. So you say, oh, in my whole list, the least thing I care about is the validity of the final coordinates. I mean, they're important, but they're not the final importance. Dean yes. sort of said many of the same things. He didn't even mention coordinates. Um, so you allow creative field data collection, data order doesn't matter, put control points anywhere you want to. He mentions weighting, all the different methods, triangle resection, redundancy. If you're doing state plane reductions, we get good closures. I didn't talk about that very much. Um, linear angular closures, advanced blunder detection, ALTA certifications. You can see we both had a lot of the same thing. We said it differently, but here's a question for you, Donnie. Uh, uh, and this is an interesting question. Uh, can you use RTK data only in processing? And with, I, I take RTK data only as being coordinates. Is those coordinates with, um, with with just the points? The, the only way that you can do that is if, if if you just have single instances of those coordinates, then you know you're that they would essentially be all side shots. That there's no redundancy. But if you shot the same point twice, so you had um, the same coordinate was entered into the job. You can do that. What it essentially would do it would be average your uh, your your. your now, I've never point. tried that having like a control file with uh, with say five point number tens, and and each of them may be assigned a different standard error. And it'll do. A, I believe it does a weighted average. Basically, does a, and you end up with a weighted average of of those points. Right. Um, Uh, the cost. The question about the cost of ServNet. Uh, ServNet comes in both Carlson Survey and CNG Survey packages. It's, it's just part of the package. We do have a standalone version of ServNet that basically consists of the data processing, the raw data editor, and the data transfer or data collection program. And I'm not real sure about the cost on it, but uh, I, I believe it's uh, in the $500 range. So unless they've changed that, that's that's what they used to sell it for, and, and that's a pretty good price for what it does. You have to really ask a salesperson uh, about that kind of stuff. There is a manual available. Uh, we're going to be putting, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's available on the website right now, but it will, we will be putting uh, uh, something on the website pretty soon. We're just about to release. ServNet 5.0. Uh, if if you want to email me, I will send you a manual uh, in HTML format. Uh, my email address again is dgoodman at carlsonsw.com. Uh, another question about international units. ServNet supports GRADs or GONs, whichever way you want to call it, for angle units, and it supports. Uh, meters feet so so we do uh, we do support international units yeah we, we support gradients and under the we can do the US foot the international foot or meters up oh, you just answered his other question international foot <clears throat> See. Well, I guess that's about it. I don't see any more questions coming in. I hope we hope we didn't screw this up too much because this is kind of new for both Donnie and I. 
and uh, we're we're trying to figure out this webinar software. We probably I probably missed a few things. <laughs> oh, here's a question: Does ServNet offer network pre-analysis? Um, no, no, not not directly. Uh, we've we've talked about how to do that and whether to do it, and we just have not come up with uh, the time or exactly. We don't not even sure we have a good feel for how we want to do that. How how we how you define your pre-analysis data. The, at present, ServNet is pretty much um, separated from CAD, and. And we were thinking a pre-analysis program, at least to get your angles in, might be more of a graphical thing than, you know, at least to, you know, to tell us where you intend to turn angles and so forth. So, all uh, best I can say is we're still thinking about it, and uh, but we do not have anything yet. Now, I guess by pre-analysis, he's talking about maybe designing a network of traverses. Yeah, yes. The, the idea would be is that you, you come, you can say, I know that I'm going to be running a, a network, and I think that I'll probably have, you know, even if it's GPS, you know, from here, and you, you can actually set your points, maybe from a aerial photo, and you'll say, I'll be turning an angle here, I'll be turning an angle here, and least square, you know, if you give us standard errors, the least squares can pre-process that and, and tell you what errors, you know, what error ellipses you, you sort of should be able to accomplish if you, you know, set up your traverse, sort of how, how you pre, you know, how, how it would, how you tentatively told us how you were going to do it. Uh, another question, is this the same as Carlson Export? It is not the same as Carlson Export. Carlson Export is is a different product altogether. Uh, uh, Carlson Export does have processing of raw data in in their in the package, but it does not have ServNet. It's uh, it's the uh, Carlson the standard Carlson uh, processing software that allows Compass, Crandall's Transit least squares, but it's not a network least squares. It's a uh, you know, it just does one traverse at a time. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that that's, that's the way export is. I, th I think you're right. I think you're right. Now, export is supplied free with serves CE, so if you don't have the Carlson software, you're allowed, that gives you gives you a way of getting your pro data off serve CE and processed before you go into your desktop software. Standalone ServNet would be able you would be able to do the same thing. You can get the data off your data collector and process and into a quarter file format. We support a lot of them. It, data collection transfer does come with um, the standalone ServNet. And I sort of moved computers around. I, I'm not. Let's see if I have the Carlson data collector stuff. Yeah, see. Well, the Carlson data collector just is serve CE and standalone serve net. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> it's just servcom, which is designed to talk to serve CE. The the C and G data collection uh, has all the data collectors available in it. I guess that's it. I, okay, it's 115. I, that was sort of the official ending, wasn't it? I think so. Okay.